The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servant Marshall, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Psalms, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Be to God. A reading from Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven through chapter five, verse five. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look to the things that are seen, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for for us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The word of the Lord. Good morning. I promise I'm not checking my email. If I do stop in the middle, though, it's because someone's calling me, but I won't deal with it. Um, I'm Timothy Brown. I am Timothy Marshall Brown. I was uh, Marshall's firstborn and first baptism. My wife Sarah and I were married here in 2001 with my dad by our side. We left a few years later for work and life and stuff 
Uh, but our experience here at Truro was very special to us. All of you welcomed us here uh, into the family immediately, and many of you have loved and supported us since, and we're so very grateful for that. <clears throat> I'm not here to deliver a eulogy or a memoriam. Um, we've got some very good friends here who can do that, and uh, we'll probably uh, keep their act together a little longer than I can. Uh, but I was asked to say something, and thus something has to be said. My dad is gone, unexpectedly, not in a way that leaves us a lot of time to get affairs in order and reminisce and wrap things up in a nice little bow. I was lying in bed with my wife Sarah last Wednesday, relaxing after work, and in one phone call, bam. Eleven months ago, I had my first son, Teddy. After 13 years of marriage, we figured it was about time to see what this baby thing was all about. <laughs> he was born via C-section after 24 hours of labor. They laid him on the cold table under the bright lights, and he was crying and waving his arms around. I gave him my finger, and he grabbed on with his little hands, and it was like instant father, like a new part of my heart had been activated. Last week, Matthew, my brother, was the one that made the phone call to explain what had happened to Dad. Teddy was due for a bottle, so I went and picked him up out of the crib. I held him, still sleeping, and snuggled him and cried. Sarah and I visited her parents near Asheville for Christmas. Marshall drove over and spent a few days with us. He had joined us in Orlando shortly after Teddy was born, and was really enjoying how much he'd grown. He was crawling all over the place, getting into the gifts and decorations and being a lot of fun. Dad had a great time with him, and they had a lot of fun together. So I snuggled Teddy last Wednesday night, and all I could think of was that visit, the last time we'd seen each other. Teddy's my firstborn, and I'm going to raise him right. He's going to be a good kid. He has a great personality, and I'm already very proud of him, and I was looking forward to showing him off to my dad over the years. So I held him, and then I gave him his bottle that night and took him back to his room. As is normal, he cried a little bit before I put him to sleep, and I regularly hear his mama singing to him over the baby monitor. It's not really my thing, but I started singing the first thing that came into my head. It was the same song my father used to sing to me. So I'm not going to try to sing it. <clears throat> my vibrato is very strong right now. But some of you know it as the spirit song. It says, Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. So in trying to think of something meaningful to say, something personal and, and embodied my father to me, I tried to come up with the, my father always said this thing, but don't let, don't let the clutch out too slowly didn't seem appropriate. <laughs> it wasn't... He wasn't really a catchphrase kind of guy. He usually got his point across with an illustration, a metaphor, and a three-point recap. <clears throat> Someone in the myriad of conciliatory Facebook messages, which, by the way, were greatly appreciated, someone referred to him as a wounded healer, and that guy nailed it. Many of you have commented in the last few days about how he helped your marriage, how he helped you in dark times, even how he may have led you to Christ, all while struggling with his own sickness and weakness. Oftentimes I found this frustrating, and it shook my faith, and it ate at my ability to hope. But now I think it is hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which I didn't know you were going to so conveniently project for me this morning, says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, 
that the excellency of the power of, may be of God and not of us. So there's hope for us yet, all of us, with our wounds, our scars, our weaknesses. Some of us have a passing illness. Some of us struggle with what seems like a permanent birth defect. All of us can be used by our Creator to bring words of change into people's lives. So I rocked Teddy to sleep last night, trying to think of the dad catchphrase, and I was suddenly able to remember the second verse of the song. Oh, come and sing this song with gladness. As our hearts are filled with joy, lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Give him, give him all your tears and sadness. Give him all your years of pain. And you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. I'm Matt Brown, and when I'm here, I'm usually hidden behind the drum cage. So thank you for letting me out. <laughs> Maybe you'll put me back. Um, remember my parents, probably 20 years ago, I think water beds were all the rage, and, and so my parents, of course, had to have one. And for whatever reason, the whole family was out that day, except for my dad and me. My dad had the great idea to, to change out the, the tubes. It had, you know, six foot by one foot or two foot tubes in there with water and the pills that kept the water from getting bad. And he had a brilliant idea to go change it out one day and want a 10-year-old Matt to help. So we took one of the tubes out and took it into the little stand-up shower he had, and he kind of propped it down and went to unfasten the, um, the top and didn't really think that part through. And next thing I know, he had old water gushing out on him and here he is screaming at the top of his lungs Matthew, help me, I need help me and I was absolutely no help because I was on the floor crying laughing <laughs> I don't think you owned a water bed for that much longer after that I don't think he liked that whole process um, in times like this we tend to hear and, and see the phrase um, rest in peace if you know my dad, I don't, think, I don't think he's doing a lot of resting. I see my dad doing a lot of talking. And talking. And talking. My dad enjoyed a lot of behind the scenes stuff, a lot of kind of just knowing what happened here and what made things tick and what put things together. And um, one of many things that drew him to theology was his love for the Lord, but also kind of just seeing what kind of pieced things together here. And I can just picture him up there right now grabbing the apostles or, or theologians or prophets or whatever and just, just asking them about this and talking about this and want to know about this until one of them just like, dude, chill. We've got time. <laughs> We've got plenty of time. I don't know if Paul really says, dude, chill, but it says it in my mind. Um, one of my earliest memories of dad, um, I was about three or four years old in South Florida. Um, I was born with a couple health issues, and one of them were poor eyes, and, and, and so I had different surgeries going up and had to have different treatments, and I never felt bad about it growing up. I, it was just a normal thing, and so my mom would always, this was before iPads, there were notepads and coloring books my mom would pack up in a bag and, and put in the car, and I'd sit in the, in the passenger seat, because back then you didn't have to have car seats till you were 20, um, so I'd sit in the passenger seat with my dad, and he would drive me across South Florida. We'd go see the eye doctor, and then on the way back, have lunch somewhere and, and go back home, and it was always a special thing. Um, he, he always took such a strong interest in, in my eyes, not just because he loved me and he was my father, but he had poor eyes, too. He didn't have them near the magnitude that I did, but he had poor eyes, too, and because of that, he could relate. He could understand. Um, just a few days ago, I went inside the eye doctor again and, and finally got some contacts that fit. I could just hear him up there cheering, saying, you finally got it. You can, you can see the chart. And just because he knew what that was like. Um, and when you're close to family, when you're really close to people, you tend to know the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, and, and the mistakes and the accolades and the failures and things. And, 
And, and we all have good and bad. We all have accolades, and we've all made mistakes. We don't all get our mistakes broadcasted for the world to see, but we've all made mistakes. But what I've learned in times like this is, is to tune a lot of that out, tune out the highs and the lows, and just to kind of look at the main, what, what was their theme? What was their life's theme? And for my dad, his theme was, was pretty clear. It was, it was helping bring healing. As Tim mentioned, it was helping bring wholeness to people, whether he was a pastor and, and, and meeting with couples about to get married, meeting with couples trying to hang on to their marriage, um, knowing someone who had lost someone, meeting with someone on their deathbed, meeting with someone at an accident scene about to be airlifted, whether it was even on that school bus with those precious kids that so many people didn't understand and just kind of rejected, but they knew when they got on that school bus that Mr. Marshall was safe and Mr. Marshall loved them. It's, it's, it's the same thing that drove him to, to care about my eyes. He might not be able to relate to each individual story, but he knew what it was like to hurt. He knew what it was like to be wounded, to be attacked. To, to, it, 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 that, that's part of what drove him, I think, to, to, to bring healing. And there's, to me, there's no truer reflection of Jesus because in Jesus we see someone who also understands, who also knows what we've been through. But I think that's what, dad, what drove Dad to drive people to Jesus was because Dad knew that not only in Jesus is there someone that understands, but there's someone who, unlike Dad, can offer victory and offer hope. And as I look at this beautiful cross, it, 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 my dad would always wear, it, it's not just some logo or some mascot that we decide to come up with. It's, it's, that's the ultimate, the worst thing that could happen. God being murdered transformed into the most beautiful thing that could happen, which is salvation. And Dad knew that only in Jesus do we have the hope that any bad thing that we go through, any suffering, any pain, not only is there someone that can relate, but there's someone who can turn that around and transform that. And Dad knew that and he experienced in his life. And now Dad has, Dad has experienced that in a way that we'll never know until we're with him because now Dad is completely healed. He is completely whole, and we're hurting, and he knows that. And today I picture him just pointing us to Jesus who can offer healing, who can use something as painful as this to turn to something beautiful. So Dad, I hope you're chatting away up there, and I hope you don't stop. I thank you for your impact here. I thank you for the times you spent with me, for the times you got to know my precious grandgirls and the precious dates you took them on. Jesus, we thank you for the gift of Marshall, and we thank you for the gift of your salvation, and thank you that we know that in you, not only can you relate and comfort us through these times, but somehow you can turn them into something beautiful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my entire family, uh, thank you for being here today. But more importantly, thank you for your love for us and, uh, and your love for my dad. He was a good man. He was a great sinner, but he had a great savior. He had such amazing pastoral skills, uh, and in the last few days, it's been overwhelming to hear and read so many stories uh, where God used my dad uh, in meaningful ways, whether it was his preaching or his pastoral care or his hospital visits, his counseling, or the smile that so many of you have written about. God used my dad to point countless lives to Jesus, and that's a legacy I will give my life to carry on. My dad was also a man of good humor, good being the operative word, I suppose. He knew how to tell a good joke, uh, how to break the ice, how to make people laugh. One of my favorite stories is from his third year of seminary at VTS, around the time the Episcopal Church was revising its prayer book. 
Dad being assigned uh, to field work at a church in Mount Vernon was approached by an older lady who uh, approached him after the service and said, if Jesus could see what they've done to his prayer book, he'd roll over in his grave. Let's <laughs> <clears throat> good one. And if you thought my dad was funny in public, I got to hear his jokes at home. I don't think he'd mind me telling you his uh, code name for the craft guild at our church in the Florida Panhandle. Stitch and bitch. <laughs> he was a good dad to my brothers and me. He was present in our lives, encouraging, strong, tender, and always telling us how proud he was of us, how much he loved us. He gave us freedom to grow up, make mistakes. He'd rescue us when we had gotten in over our heads. Most importantly, he planted the seeds and watered the soil so that my brothers and I could hear and respond to the good news of the gospel. He knew and he shared the freedom of Christ. But my dad was also a man who knew great bondage in his life. He fought and he struggled. Sometimes he won. Sometimes he lost in the battle against sin and the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. He was a normal, sinful man. But he was also a pastor called to a certain standard. And for how he fell short of that standard, on my dad's behalf, I'd like to ask you to forgive him. Over the last several years, it's been hard for me to forgive him. I didn't see him or talk to him much uh, while I waited to see what kind of man he would be, what kind of decisions he'd make. And several months ago, we began to rebuild our relationship and talk again and exchange text messages. And I saw a humbled man, a contrite man, a more feeble man, a man pursuing the Lord, a good man. And you can learn a lot about a man when you go through the place where he lived. And through his belongings, as I, my brothers, and my sisters-in-law have begun to do over the last few days. I see a man who had a devotional, or a Bible, or a journal, or a prayer book, or a book on the hard sayings of Jesus, or a workbook on finding freedom in Christ on every table, or nightstand, or dresser, or chair. Until the last day of his life, my dad was pursuing Jesus, and I am proud of him. You know the depth of my dad's giftedness. And my dad knew the depth of his sin. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus took the punishment for my dad's sin, and my sin and your sin, on the cross. There is a grace that is greater than all our sin. It is amazing grace. And it not only saves wretches like us, but it leads us home. That grace has led my dad home. Until the end, my dad, in the words of Paul, fought the good fight, he finished the race, and he kept the faith. And that faith is in a redeemer whose nail-scarred hands reached down to my dad on his apartment floor and said, come with me, Marshall. You're free. God's grace reaches downward, and it reaches deeper than our sin, and it leads us home. And that is my dad's last sermon to us today. That our hope is not in our giftedness or our charm or our reputations. And our salvation is not won or lost depending on our performance. Our hope and our salvation is in Christ alone. It was won by Christ alone. Marshall Brown's life, all of it, from beginning to end, the good and the bad, successes and failures, are hidden in Christ. He was a good man. He was a great sinner. He is a great savior. So the hard news of this week is that my dad is no longer here. The good news of the gospel is that he is risen. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand together and sing. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. 
Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You can be seated. What Jamie said. <laughs> Any of you, a lot of ministers and preachers and people here this morning, that's it's the Gospel. What Matt said, what Tim said, I pray when my time comes that the testimony of my three children to point to Jesus would look like that. My wife Nancy and I had the privilege of serving as youth pastors, worship leaders at St. John's in Kissimmee, Florida for most of the 1990s under Marshall Brown, Patty, and a great church there. I remember and I've often said that Marshall was the best boss I ever had. I can tell you exactly why. First of all, he protected me. One of the first days I arrived at that church, they removed the organ from the organ pit and put in a drum set. Now, I knew that wouldn't bother anyone at Truro, where, by the way, I grew up here as a very young person. But there, I had nothing to do with it, but of course, when the young, new worship pastor youth pastor shows up and the organ disappears and the drums come, of course there's some association to be made. I didn't find out until that Marshall took the bullets from me on that one and many other times, and he permitted me to learn to lead, where now I lead my own congregation with things I learned from him because I wasn't always looking over my shoulder at the criticism. Secondly, he trusted me. He allowed me to preach and to learn to speak publicly, as young youth pastors are wont to do. I sometimes pushed the envelope of what to say and how to say it. But he never seemed threatened if I received praise, and he never seemed to be angry if there was criticism given to him because of what I had done. And finally, he loved me. He universally affirmed Nancy and me and our children He let me function as an equal, almost an assistant pastor, he would call me, though I didn't have a seminary degree or the experience requisite to that calling. He always let me know that my ministry was valuable. For all those things, I will be grateful. But in remembering Marshall this morning, if it were not a Christian burial, then I would just say, well, that's it, because it's all the great things that, of course, curry us favor with God. But as we've heard so eloquently put, that's not it. Marshall was a colossal sinner, like you and like me. And a Christian funeral differs because it's not in the things we remember that we did well that curry us favor with God, but it's in our need to throw ourselves upon his mercy. The fight against sin is common to all, and the Bible aptly says it so easily entangles us. So as I consider these things, you know this, but some of you may not. But as I look at the gospel this morning, I take great comfort. The gospel of John 6 is really answering a question because Jesus was sought after by the people to meet their temporal needs for bread because they were hungry again and they'd just seen him feed 5,000, walk on water, do miracles, and they wanted 
that daily bread once again. And then in verse 28, he's asked one of the critical questions of all of life. What must we do to be doing the work of God? It's my question this morning. Are you doing the work of God? What do we think of when we think of doing God's work? Well, they thought of feeding people with bread. They thought of meeting the needs now. And if you get this answer wrong, you've missed the entire gospel. Jesus answers in verse 29, and he says, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. See, the work of God does not begin with feeding people. It doesn't begin with any work that we do of any sort. It begins with believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to ask you to just think about, for those of you who, for for this, this message seems unbelievable, Truly, I think there's only really good responses to hearing the gospel presented like that. It's to be upset that it's so easy. How could someone who'd done so much wrong, like Marshall or me or you, just believe in Christ and it's all okay? Should make us stop and pause that Selfish hypocrites who make bad choices can can earn the same as good people. And we have to come to understand that that's an okay way to feel because it's not just in human terms. Jesus doesn't give any of us what we deserve. The gospel says we all deserve to die because sin separates us from him. But the day you realize that you and I are the selfish hypocrites who've made wrong choices, it's the best news ever. And rather than making us upset, it's the only news that will ultimately matter because brothers and sisters, friends, this life is a breath. It will be over when we least expect it. And eternity is forever and ever. And the gospel is this. You can sit with God in glory and receiving all that was due Jesus can be yours. Or you can say you don't need it and pay the price for your own sin and rebellion against God. May I encourage you with everything within me to choose the first. For those of you who know this truth but do not walk in this truth, do not be deceived. It is not intellectual knowledge that is belief, it is what you act upon. For those of you who seems this is too good to be true, please try it. For those of you who, like me, can't believe that we were so blessed to be chosen by the Lord, as the gospel said this morning, he knows who are his and he has taken us. Then as we pray, fall in gratitude that he is yours, you are his, and that Marshall Brown, not because he was 51% good and 49% bad or the other way around, is in heaven, but because Jesus Christ did it all for him, And Marshall Brown believed and did the work of God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thanks for bringing into my life such a boss. Who mean so much to my family and who have helped change us and shape us. But Lord, today isn't ultimately about Marshall. He comes to point us to you. And as the living presence here, 
we honor you for his life. We honor you that he struggled until the end to pursue the one who loved him beyond reason. Help us to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite us to stand as we rehearse together the basics of our faith as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, is seated into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Jesus, bread from heaven, you satisfy the hungry with good things. Grant us a share with all the faithful departed in the banquet of your kingdom. Hear us, risen Lord. Jesus, the light of the world, you gave the man born blind the gift of sight and open the eyes of his faith. Bring those in darkness to your eternal light and glory. Hear us, risen Lord. Jesus, Son of the living God, you summoned your friend Lazarus from death to life. Raise us at the last to full and eternal life with you. Hear us, risen Lord. Jesus, crucified Savior, in your dying you entrusted each to the other, Mary, your mother, and John, your beloved disciple. Sustain and comfort all who mourn. Hear us, Risen Lord. Jesus, our way and truth and life, you drew your disciple Thomas from doubt to faith. Reveal the resurrection faith to the doubting and the lost. Hear us, risen Lord. May God in his infinite love and mercy bring the whole church, living and departed in the Lord Jesus, to a joyful resurrection and the fulfillment of his eternal kingdom. Amen. Father in heaven, we praise your name for all who have finished this life loving and trusting you for the example of their lives, the life and grace you gave them and the peace in which they rest. We praise you today for your servant Marshall and for all that you did through him. Meet us in our sadness and fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving for the sake of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, Deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn, that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, our Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and rise again. His cross declares your love to be without limit. His resurrection, that death, our last enemy, is doomed. 
By his victory, we are assured of the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. That neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we stand in this hope and in this peace, let us share with one another the peace that the Lord gives us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. you. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Marshall. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the blessed and holy and undivided Trinity, keep you this day and forever. Amen.
Well, I wanted to say something different, but I'm going to do what that says. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen.